Jernigan, your tour guide into discoveries, coming to you live from the heart of America to around the globe via the World Wide Web, satellite, and podcast. Let's journey together into the realms of the known to the unknown in search of enlightenment, knowledge, and truth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. This is Rebecca Jernigan, and you're listening to Journeys with Rebecca right here on Project Camelot TV. We have a really fantastic guest for you today. His name is Ben Mesrick. He's the author of the book that we're going to be talking about today called The 37th Parallel. Now, I want to add here that he is more than just an author of this book. He's a multiple New York Times best-selling author. I'm really a privilege, really, to have him here. Now, Ben's here to tell the true story, the true and mysterious story, I guess you could say, of a gentleman that we're going to come to know as Chuck Zukowski. Um, and this is a true story based on the mysterious phenomena that have alarmed homeowners and ranchers for decades. Now, these documents of Zukowski's um, are, are, there are hundreds and there's hundreds of them, but if you read the book, and we're going to get really into that a little bit later, if you read the book, you're going to realize that it's more than just hundreds, there's thousands of these bizarre incidences. Um, but Zukowski himself wrote most of this information down and cataloged it, but these are incidents of cattle mutilations and UFO sightings along the southern borders of Utah, Colorado, and Kansas. They also stretch far beyond through the heart of America, actually all across it. So this is really just going to be a fantastic show. There's going to be a lot of things that we're going to talk about you may know about, uh, but maybe you have forgotten about, because I know there sure was some stuff in here that I learned about, or relearned, I should say, uh, kind of ignited that passion again. It's a really cool book, and it's really great to have Ben here with us. I want to also remind people that if you have questions for Ben today, please put them in the chat box in all capital letters uh, so we know that there's a question. And Brian, my engineer, will forward those to us. He may uh, break in. I don't know. However, he wants to do that so that we can get your questions answered because this is the time to do it because this is going to be a really, really great show. And without further ado, let's welcome Ben to the show. Hi, Ben. Hi. How are you? Thanks for having me. Hey, you know what? It's absolutely fantastic to have you here. This is a... This has really been a really fun book to read. I have to tell you, I didn't get through every single bit of it, but I got through, like, I'd say 90%, 95% of it, still reading it. Um, some of it I had to go back and reread because it was the geography of it itself was like, okay, i got to put myself in that place again. I mean, this guy covers Area 51 extensively. Uh, mm -hmm. The hum in, in, uh, in New Mexico... Uh, he talks about the cattle mutilations and the ranchers. Now, some of these are the stories that that didn't make it to mainstream or that didn't make it to the newspapers, perhaps. Uh, some of these may have been stories that, that people didn't share except for with the detective and things like that. But my curiosity is here is as I'm looking at your list of all your books that you've written, what? How did you? How did you even get to the point of writing the writing this book? This it's actually based on a true story documentary of of Chuck Stokowski's work. Yeah. Well, I mean, I write true stories. You know, I was I wrote the book that was the movie The Social Network, and yep. the book was movie Twenty One. And I never set out to write about UFOs. I didn't sort of have any knowledge for that that much. I wasn't really a believer. I would call myself. I was a skeptic. Um, I was intrigued by the story of Chuck. I had been told about Chuck. Uh, Chuck was a reserve sheriff's deputy in Colorado who had lost his job after investigating a cattle mutilation. Um, I knew nothing about cattle mutilations. Uh, I was interested in Chuck because he had this obsession with UFOs. He kind of threw himself into the world of UFOs. And so I thought I was going into writing a story about this one guy's obsession, a kind of close encounters type story. Um, but as I delved into it and as I dug into what he was looking at, I became blown away by it. And, and uh, his journeys up and down the 37th parallel, um, which is where this UFO highway is that he's found, um, it, it kind of changed my views of the whole phenomenon. And I really wanted to dig into, 
you know, why the mainstream doesn't cover it, and I wanted to try and cover it myself. Well, I have to tell you, there, you know, as I'm rereading this story again, you know, rereading a lot of these stories that I had heard about before, and I'm, I'm reading all of this, and I'm thinking, okay, so, you know, this guy, Ben, brings out all of this information that we've heard of before, but in this way, we have this man's documentation of his life, basically, is what this is. And this comes from a guy that, you know, can is very believable. He's very knowledgeable. I mean, he's not some kind of a little, you know, a quack right. or whatever. And, you know, you, you read it and you go through it and it puts it in such a, I don't know, in such an order. You know, it's an orderly right. fashion that you can really wrap your mind around it and you think, ah, oh, this is a huge picture. It's right. a huge picture, and even what Mr. Zukowski covered is just not even probably touching the tip of the iceberg, you know, yeah. in, in comparison. It's just fabulous. Yeah. So, so um, as, as, as we're looking at the geography, start out with one of your favorite. I mean, how did you start out with him? Did you start out with him in the, right from the very beginning? Did he sit down with you and just kind of chronologically give you his documentation, or did you sit right. down and vet, vet, visit with him? Well, I flew out to Colorado. You know, he had he had been fired from the sheriff's department. He was now a self-described UFO nut. He had an RV. <laughs> yeah, he, of course. Pack, yeah, exactly. He packs his family into an RV, and he goes from UFO sighting to UFO sighting. So I decided I'd have to go there and meet with him. So I flew out there, and, you know, he picks me up in the airport, puts a bulletproof vest on me, gives me a gun, and he's like, we're going off into the mountains. <laughs> it was that kind of... <laughs> really fascinating guy uh and he uh took me to his office in his house which is basically like a file cabinets full of pictures and sightings and cattle mutilation documentation and and everything you could possibly think of and i just was completely you know in awe of, of the amount of information he would put together um and i just started there and then he became kind of my guide and you know i purposefully set out to write this book for a mainstream audience um one that really isn't doesn't know anything about Roswell, for instance, doesn't know all the stuff that I think you, you know, know so much about and, and, and sort of take for granted. They, they have very little knowledge of, of this world. So it is kind of a travelogue into the, the UFO hotspots, you know, from Area 51 to Dulce Mountain to everything you would, you would get into. But um, through the eyes of this guy who, who goes deeper and deeper down this rabbit hole, um, and, uh, and he's very believable. You're right. He's, he's a guy who's not you know, as he calls himself a UFO nut, but he's, he's you know, a scientist, he's uh, a chip engineer, microchip engineer. Um, he's got the sort of investigative chops of, a, of a, someone who worked in the sheriff's department for 20 years. So he goes into each of his things as a kind of self-made expert um, on these things. Um, he's not just looking at a place where a cow was found, but he's analyzing the soil. He's trying to take readings. He's trying to find out from a scientific point of view what what the heck is going on um and that's that's where i started yeah well you know he he's a fascinating guy because i was you know as as i'm reading the book and i'm i'm paying attention to how he's viewing things you know this is I, right. obviously from his viewpoint how he's viewing a scene or what he's looking at and his observation skills are are probably better than most because of his background and training you know of being a sheriff and you know you have to kind of be a detective um and he he kind of goes in into it what do he call himself something skeptic um yeah uh a, what was that term he used? I wish I could remember it. Um, uh, he was a, not a non-believer, but he he came in as a, a um, as a change skeptic or something. I wish I could right. remember that term. Yeah. It's yeah. right in the very beginning of the book, too. Anyway, uh, I th I always I found that really fascinating that it was like he admitted that it was more of a curiosity thing when he started this, right. um, and it was more about what isn't being told, right? And right. so that that's the investigative skills that comes with his training. Right. So I think that was really, really fascinating um, about that and how he viewed the people that showed him where it was he was going, how his family, how he interacted with his family. I think, by the way, I, don't, I was thinking about that. I was like, you know, I got kids of my own. I don't know what they would have done if I would put them all in a Winnebago and said, come on, let's go. And, you know, I don't that yeah. they would have handled it quite so well. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite things about Chuck is, you know, his wife, Tammy, is is not a believer. Um, she she thinks he's kind of crazy. 
Um, she goes along with it. She supports him. She, you know, she does two jobs to help support him. But um, she's not a believer at all, and so he's not just trying to convince the world that they're real. He's she's trying. He's trying to convince his wife that it's all real. Um, so that's kind of a fascinating subject to get into his family life and how he can be so passionate about UFOs while you know when he comes home, his wife thinks that he's just completely crazy. So it's kind of a fun dynamic that we get into. Yeah. Well, he exposes a lot of things in this book. Um, I think was was really a, a one of my favorite ways that this really came out. I mean, because he talked about MUFON, which is the Mutual right. UFO Network, and what they're what they do and what they haven't done for the public, and um, what his thoughts were on, you know, why they didn't do what they should have been doing in in the beginning. Right. Um, has, so, go ahead. Yeah, he has a complicated relationship with MUFON. Um, you know, MUFON is is the grassroots. Um, large uh, investigative organization that that people can join. Um, Chuck is is currently a member. He's currently kind of the head of their cattle mutilation. His sister is a director of MUFON. Um, so, but he he considers it a uh, uh, not necessarily a, a helpful organization. He finds that they uh, might have connections in the government. He believes. He worries about what information he gives them or what information they have. He sometimes worries about that they don't have labs, for instance, to look at the stuff. So if they find something, they're sending it off somewhere and he wonders where. Um, so Chuck's opinion of MUFON um, isn't necessarily that positive, um, even though he does use them because the resources they have um, in terms of seeing you know, all of the reports that come in immediately, people call them. And that way, if Chuck wants to get his hands on stuff, he has to get it through them. So over the course of the book, his relationship with them becomes more and more complicated. Um, but uh, yeah, I was fascinated by the whole thing. Yeah, and there's somebody that doesn't really know the inner workings, they may be interested in UFOs or the cattle mutilations or you know all of that stuff. But if they're not inter- if they're not knowledgeable of MUFON, it might be something for them, you know, to look into and do some investigative work on their own. You know. Right. Um, you know, these shows are not meant to give everybody all the information, just dump it in their lap. It, it's, it's, we're supposed to be piquing their interest, too, so that they go out if they find something that they like what you say or what you've presented in the, the material you've presented in the book, that they go and do their own research as well. Right. Um, I mean, that's the whole point. So let's talk about, let's talk about the cattle mutilations. I, you know, through the years, there's been, you know, thousands of reports of these cattle mutilations. Uh-huh. Right. Um, cattle mutilations is one of the, the phenomenon that really drew me into this story. So since the, the 40s and even earlier, there have been over 10,000 cows and horses found lying on their left side, usually missing organs, missing eye and tongue and heart and lungs. The bodies are completely drained of blood. Um, there's no blood at the scene. There's no scuff marks. There's no marks of predators. All of the cuts are surgical and usually circular. Um, some of these cattle have been found dropped from a height. Um, and it got to be such a big phenomenon that in the 70s, uh, three state governors petitioned the Attorney General of the United States demanding an investigation. Um, the FBI was called in. The FBI involved 100 agents over a 10-year investigation, and, inve- and no one's ever been arrested. They came no real conclusion. Um, they couldn't find anything. And it's a weird, weird thing. Now, Chuck himself started to think this is UFO-related. He believes it's, it's a UFO-involved thing. Um, that's what ended up getting him fired from the sheriff's department. Uh, the El Paso department in Colorado didn't like someone who is a sheriff, a reserve sheriff, talking about UFOs. Um, and so they got rid of him, and, and Chuck continues to investigate cattle mutilations to this day. It's just something that intrigues him, and it's something that's never really had a real answer. And you never read about it in, in New York Times. You're never going to see it in a major newspaper or magazine, which is strange because it involves so many people, um, so many ranchers. And I spoke to a lot of ranchers who are devastated by this. You know, they leave, they lose horses, which are part of the family. They lose cows, which are expensive for them. Um, and the, the animals are brutally murdered, um, missing parts and, and no blood. So it freaks a lot of people out. Um, I don't know, you know, whether you can say it's UFO related or not. I think that isn't something that's clear to me, but it's certainly something that isn't explained yet. 
and I say, I, you know, it's a centerpiece of the book. Well, the, one of the most gripping stories you had about the cattle mutilations was one of the first ones in the book where um, mm-hmm. the, the, the horses, uh, they found the horses at that lady's ranch and the dog, right. the dog that was, and there was one, one horse that was left and it was drooling and doing all kinds of weird things and it was yeah. just acting all kinds of, you know, frightened and scared like it had, it had seen something that right. was not normal for it to see or experience or whatever the case may be. I don't, you know, I can't speak to it. I wasn't there, right. but, and the yeah. dog, the same way. And right. they they left with marks on them as well. There were marks on the horse. And as, if I'm not mistaken, I remember that the, the uh, dog too, and there was high EMF readings mm-hmm. uh, on the dog, but not on the horse. Right. Um, you know, that's indicative of something, uh, but the EMF readings is, is what was really curious is that he was taking out an EMF reader to begin with, um, you know, to these cattle mutilations and running tests on them and, you know, marking each specific spot. And he felt the grooves, I think, wasn't it in the bones? He was feeling yeah. the grooves in the, the bones? The bones uh, along the rib cage seem that they have grooves in them. Uh, the dog was so traumatized it won't leave the house anymore. It had some sort of a mark, a wound on it. Um, the... Um, the, uh, the other horse, there was a, a third horse that wasn't uh, touched, essentially, but had a couple wounds on it and was so traumatized that they ended up having to get rid of this horse. Um, it, it was creepy, you know, and, and they, uh, they uh, months later, did also see uh, what appeared to be some sort of a black helicopter over their ranch. Um, and most of these uh, cattle mutilations are usually followed by some sort of sighting of black helicopters. Um, so there's some sort of investigative agency that's looking into this as well, um, uh, but it's it's a it's a weird situation, and and Chuck has seen many of these, but this particular one is what ended up getting him fired. Well, let me ask you this because it just dawned on me um, that you, when you said that about the black helicopters, now those black hel- helicopters being seen mm-hmm. um, after the people um, report it. Or are they being seen even before the people report it? Well, you kind of have both. You have both okay. situations going on. You also have a lot of aerial phenomenon, a lot of UFO sightings in the areas of cattle mutilations. Um, things like that are, are very uh, common in these situations, which is why Chuck thinks it's UFO related. Um, the helicopters is a strange one. You know, they're always unmarked. They're always coming by over the ranches within a few days of the mutilation. Um, they're not involved in the mutilation. Um, I think they're after the fact. But in the 70s, the reason the governor's petition the attorney general is this had been going on, and when uh, these state uh, governments attempted to do land surveys, the ranchers would shoot at their helicopters um, because the ranchers were so traumatized about what was going on in their ranches, they just assumed anyone flying over them was was up to no good. Um, And that's the reason the investigating was first started, was they could no longer fly over the ranches with helicopters. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's an amazing story, I think. Wow. So we already have a question from the chat room. They're say, asking, how does the 37th parallel fit into this? And before sure. you answer that, Brian, if I can't see what you're doing. So if you would, please put that map up, um, where, uh, it shows where I think this is, this was from, uh, one of the sites, it's up. Okay, this is from one of the sites that was, uh, was this part of your site? or? Yeah, so no, so yeah. um, so Chuck, uh, Chuck Zukowski, uh, after sort of he gets fired from the Sheriff's Department, he starts to really look into all of these cattle mutilations, all of these UFO sightings, and being uh, someone of a, a pattern seeker, I guess, from his career in the chip industry, he starts putting it all up on a map, and he came to the conclusion that a large portion of these cattle mutilations were occurring along the 37th parallel, which is this geographic line that runs straight through the middle of the United States. Um, he also found that many, if not most, of the UFO sightings he was seeing were on that line. Many, if not most, of America's underground uh, military bases, uh, from Area 51 to the Pentagon to um, Cheyenne Mountain, are all along this line. And a lot of American Indian uh, burial sites are also along the 37th which uh, has a very high uh, star people component to it. Most uh, Native American mythology involves alien visitation. Um, So 
it's, a, it's this weird confluence of events that occurs along this parallel, runs you know, along the borders of Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, um, straight down through the middle of the country. Um, and that's where Chuck started to center his research. So he starts moving up and down the 37th parallel from site to site, um, looking for a reason, you know, looking for some sort of correlation to make sense out of all of this. Well, and I, I appreciate that information. I appreciate you sharing that with the audience as well. You know, mm-hmm. you have to ask yourself, e- even if you're not a non-believer, totally non-believer, that what you just shared with everybody about the military underground bases, about this is where most of the sightings and the you know the majority of the sightings and, and mutilations took place, um, and all the other things, that mm. there's something in the the burial grounds of the of the uh, Native Americans, and there's there's obviously something going on along that grid line, that energy line, you know it's not. It's not a coincidence. I, first of all, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe that everything has a reason, even if it's, it, it doesn't seem, uh, it, it doesn't seem like it's present at the moment, right? But everything has a reason. It may be far connected, but it does have a reason. This 37th parallel. As soon as I seen that map, and and looked at that more closely, I was like, okay, well, this is. These are stories. I, I have. I, I have probably about 15 people that I have interviewed through the years that have told me stories about their own uh, hauntings and, you know, ghost stories and uh, UFO sightings and things like this that take place more towards the east of from Missouri over. And that's where most of theirs are coming from. So I find this really interesting because this is like a connect the dot for me from just from my years of doing, you know, the the interviews with people that have written about their own stories. And they're very, by the way, they're very individualized. There are only a few things. And this one covers a gamut of hundreds, if not thousands of right. reports. So there's something there. I wish, you know, here's here's the question. Does anybody really know what's going on in the 37th parallel? What is it? Who knows? But there's right. an attraction there for some reason. Right. I mean, Chuck definitely gets into, you know, he has his own theories about it. Um, but really, for him, it's just a, it guides his investigations. Um, there seems to be some sort of underground cavern cistern in, in this mm-hmm. in this area. Um, there seems to be, you know, a water uh, source that runs along from one side to the other. The U.S. military often uh, utilizes already a present underground cavern systems when they build their bases. Um, so. Their reasoning for, for going in this area is probably because these caverns exist, um, and it's who knows, you know, it's it's uh, it's intriguing, and uh, and it's definitely a, a cool centerpiece to the story. It is. It's it's really fascinating when you start thinking about it. Again, we'll answer some of the some of people's questions here today, but again, what it'll do is it'll raise more questions than it'll answer in some ways um, because we don't have all the answers. You know, you. You've done us a big service here by bringing forth this information of uh, Mr. Zukowski's life work, really, if you think about it, his life work, and bringing it forward and him being able to connect these dots, so to speak, um, himself and bringing this forward, even if we don't have the answer as to how these dots are truly all connected. But it is a, it is a fascinating, fascinating thing for sure. I, I believe that. So let's talk a little bit about the... Uh, you, you you got into the he Chuck got into the Area 51 thing. He got into the hum mm-hmm. in New Mexico. Uh, he got into a lot of the UFO sightings. Uh, I think one of the most interesting stories was um, was uh, well, there was quite a few. There's there's not just the most. There's quite a few stories, but and I just lost one because I had three of them that came in all at once, and I, I got to pick it all apart again. Um, the the uh, one in Area 51, let's see, where is it? Doesn't he have a daughter? Didn't he have a daughter? Chuck. Chuck, yeah. Didn't he have yeah, a daughter? Yeah. And they were in there digging in the dirt, and he's talking about the... Him and his sister at Roswell. Yeah. Uh, they did an archaeological dig That's at it. Roswell in the actual crash site, um, and he ended up finding something. He found a little fragment, which he thinks uh, was part of the original debris. Um he, uh, uh, intriguingly enough, uh, took the, the fragment and, and, and basically tried to find someone to analyze it. And that's how we get into the Bigelow aerospace story. Um, 
yeah, which is a, a fascinating segue in, in the book. And one of the things that really intrigued me um, when writing it is, uh, so Bigelow, Robert Bigelow, is this reclusive billionaire, made his fortune in real estate um, with Budget Suites of America originally and, and built a, a billion dollar fortune. Um, Bigelow uh, now runs Bigelow Aerospace, which is a, a major, um, they make pieces for the International Space Station. They had a piece on the last SpaceX mission, not the one that blew up, but the one before that. It's called the Trans Hab. Um, there are, there are, there are, you know, a big, uh, a big uh, company. Um, Bigelow, throughout his life, has been into the UFO thing. Has spent a large part of his fortune attempting to either prove or disprove the existence of UFOs. He funded something called the National Institute of Discovery Science for many years, which hired a bunch of real scientists to attempt to look at. Um, UFOs and UFO sightings and to try and find the truth. He bought Skinwalker Ranch, um, which was a strange ranch in Utah where all of these bizarre phenomena were going on. Um, it was uh, you know, called Skinwalkers, which are the American Indian. Uh, uh, they steal your soul. They can, they're shapeshifters. They look like animals. Um, a lot of UFO sightings, cattle mutilations. Bigelow bought it, um, put up a fence, and then installed a bunch of scientists there. Um, anyways, when Chuck found a little piece of material, he put out a press release at Roswell saying, I found a piece of what I think is the original debris. Will anybody help me analyze it? He was contacted by Bigelow's people. They uh, have a lab where they analyze UFO stuff. Um, they took his piece. They analyzed it. They sent him a, a response saying that they could not figure out in their entire catalog of of, of known uh, of products, this did not match anything. Uh, they didn't have any, it wasn't a smoking gun, they couldn't say that it was alien or whatever, but they had no answer as to what it was. Um, and then they stopped all contact with Chuck. Chuck oh. became very suspicious of them. Chuck believes that Bigelow is involved with reverse engineering alien technology um, and that, you know, there are a lot of conspiracy theories about Bigelow. I personally think that Bigelow is more a good guy than a bad guy. I think that Bigelow is really attempting to to find the truth. I, he's a true believer, um, but wants to use science and use his fortune to find real answers. Um, people in the UFO world think that Bigelow is working with the Defense Department. Um, he is working with NASA, and this is a really interesting thing. The FAA, you know, that our, our American pilots are all involved with, they have a manual. In the manual, if you look in the manual, uh, if a UFO is seen by a pilot, if a pilot sees something they can't understand, they don't report it to the FAA. They don't report it to the United States government. They report it to Bigelow. And this is fascinating to me that a private company is now uh, the person that our pilots are officially supposed to report UFO sightings to. Um, and this is in the UFO manual. The UFO manual, I, I reprinted this page in my book, The 37th Parallel, so you can see it for yourself. Um, it's a wild thing. So obviously, you know, it used to be the U.S. government investigated UFOs. Now we have essentially uh, outsourced that to Bigelow. Um, and uh, that's a really cool kind of connection to the whole story. Um, so whether Bigelow's a good guy or a bad guy, you know, remains a question, I think. Um, I think that he has a lot of information, um, thousands and thousands of files, because he was running, you know, he still runs his own investigations, well-funded, you know, men in black, essentially. Um, these are the people who will go in, and, and seek this stuff out, and then they have the means to do it. Um, but he doesn't, you know, publicize his information. His information is not available to the public. He shut me down. You know, I had a source inside his company, so I was able to get some really amazing information. But all my attempts to get him to talk to me were all shut down by his publicity people because his company has all these relationships with NASA because they're building real things for the space station. They can't be seen as being kooky, you know, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so they have to kind of hide their true purpose, which is involves the UFO studies. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> it's a wild, it's a wild segue into the story um, that fascinates me. I love writing about sort of these underground secret things, and and this is clearly something that has never really been publicized. Although you can find a little bit here and there on the internet about it, but the FAA thing was just stunning to me. That is that stunning. stunning. Um, uh, I, I I've heard I've stories. Heard I don't know why we got some feedback there. I've I've heard a lot of stories where uh, airline pilots anymore 
are not, they just don't report it. So it's interesting to note that there actually are, but it's just not to any official capacity, capacity. but it's all, all un, unofficial. You're talking about right. unofficial back channels. Absolutely, and it's written right in their manual. Um, you know, if an airline pilot reports it to the FAA, they'll get fired. Um, if they report it to, you know, their own bosses at the airlines, they'll get fired because everyone will say, your pilot is crazy. Um, but if they report it to Bigelow, he sends a team out to investigate. Well, and I think that's interesting. So let me ask you a question about that. seems how Bigelow has got all this money and, you know, he's, he's done all these things. Do you think he could be part of what's going on with the black helicopter thing? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's who knows? You know, he definitely would send Chuck believes that. Uh, so Bigelow also had a relationship with MUFON. Bigelow right. did their star team program. MUFON has a star or had a star team program where the best investigators um, would be called on uh, for important investigations. They would be funded with a stipend and given equipment. Bigelow was paying for that. Um, he then decided to cut off the star team program because he thought that MUFON wasn't a scientific enough organization, that they weren't um, uh, professional enough um, to work with. But Chuck's belief is that he uses MUFON to get the information to, to hear about the sightings, but then sends his own team. Chuck says that many investigations that he's done, uh, Bigelow's people already have been there or already on their way there, and that information was going through MUFON. So Chuck is very suspicious of it all. Well, and I, I, I can't say that I wouldn't be either in, in his position, honestly, because it just it is, that was my first thought was that, well, it, you know, if we've got this private contractor basically and he's got all this money to build all these things and you know he's, maybe he is back engineering who knows but the thing is is black helicopters if he's got the permission from somebody right, right. if he's the go-to guy for any investigations by airline pilots or whatever then you got to know he's got you know some free reign there where the rest of the public or people would not have so it's it's something to maybe think about, you know. Hopefully, we can find some answers to that. Sure. Yeah, it, it's it's bizarre and it's it's intriguing, and uh, I, I was excited to sort of get into it as much as I could. Well, and it's it, I'm I'm sad for you though that you weren't able to get any more information from from that yeah. part of it. But I guess it's you know that whole idea, and it it, it really kind of upsets me is about the need to know. I guess you didn't need to know. <laughs> Right, didn't right, get the right. information, right? right? And like, who decided that I couldn't know that, right? right. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, I, get a, I get a little bit on a soapbox with stuff like that, Ben. My bad. Uh -huh. um, anyway, so, okay, so we've got the, the cattle mutilations, and, and you you kind of explained that really well as far as how that, you know, what kind of the chain of command is, is where people would be, you know, they contact somebody, usually their local sheriff or police department when they find that. Right. Um, and it is sad to watch what is, I've seen just a gazillion pictures of these animals that afterwards, right. um, it, it's, it really is just, um, it's just really, it's just really awful. Right. Um, so, all right, so my, my uh, producer, Brian, wants to know, why Chuck was fired and did some incident. I think you talked about that incident. Yeah. What was the incident well, so and why he Chuck, got fired? Yeah, so while Chuck Chuck was a reserve sheriff's deputy for many, many years, decades, um, he always kept his UFO hobby separate from his job as a sheriff. Um, you know, people in the uh, department knew what he was into. He had got, he got the nickname the Molder of El Paso, Colorado, yeah. Um, because it kind of spread around, and so people would always take him aside and tell him their UFO stories, but he never brought it with him on his investigations. He was clued into a cattle uh, mutilation on a ranch in Rush, Colorado, uh, by a reporter um, who had sort of done a story on it. So Chuck went out there and interviewed, you know, the, the rancher was doing his investigation when a local news team came and wanted to interview the rancher. Um, they also interviewed Chuck, Chuck on camera basically uh, intimated that there was UFO involvement. When the sheriff's department saw this, that's when they, uh, they summarily dismissed him, um, decided that they did not want someone who believed in UFOs being known as a reserve sheriff's deputy. Um, so that was the end of his job there. He was, he was upset about it. 
that made a lot of news um, in Colorado. Um, but Chuck, you know, went on, and that's when he became this this UFO hunter. <laughs> well, I think now we'd call that discrimination because of your belief system. <laughs> I mean, good thing. I, I, sadly, UFO belief is not a protected class. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. <laughs> so, I would be, I'd be throwing out straws there. <laughs> trial as I may, right? Right. Yeah, right. it's too bad. It really is. It's too bad. And you know, we we have to know that something is going on, or or people wouldn't be wouldn't be so judged by it. That's the other. Well, I mean, that's wrong. part of what's you know. I I got into this story because it's really true that you know mainstream scientists can't look into the UFO phenomenon. Mainstream journalists can't cover it. A sheriff, you know, can't investigate it. A pilot can't report it. Um, because, you know, of this whole sort of bias that it's crazy. Um, and the problem is, is you create a cover-up without there even needing to be one. Um, you make it impossible for anyone to really look into this. You know, cattle mutilation, uh, such a huge phenomenon. The only real in-depth article about it was in We Magazine from the 80s. A porno oh, wow. mag from the 80s did the most extensive uh, story on it. And that's really bizarre uh, that you don't have any mainstream places to cover this stuff. And, uh, and that's because of this, this bias against this world um, that it's, it's got to be crazy or it's got to be, you know, a joke or it can't possibly be real. Um, and that's just not really true anymore. Uh, the, the, the impediments to believing in UFOs are falling. Um, you know, uh, we used to believe there isn't life on other planets because... It, it seemed unlikely. Now we know there probably is life on other planets. You know, we find a new Earth-like planet every day. We used to think they're too far away. The vastness of space makes it impossible that anyone ever got here. But we now know that's not true. Uh, Proxima Centauri, which is, you know, has an Earth-like planet around it, is uh, reachable by current technology in 40 years. Um, so it's not that far away. Um, so the reasons to not believe anyone's ever been here have gone away. Um, so it shouldn't be something that you look at as crazy. Now, listen, 99.999% of these sightings have an explanation. You know, a military test, um, you know, a drone, you know, something like that. But it's that 0.001% that we're just not looking at. And these things have to be investigated. Um, there's no reason why mainstream um, journalists or scientists aren't looking into this. You know, and I have to agree, and I think the other side of that is what happens to these people that they, these incidents is the point zero zero one right. percent if if that's the percentage you're going with, what happens to them? Yeah. You know, I mean, they, they, they have no support group. People all around them, um, you know, are pointing fingers at them. You know, they're outcasts. I mean, Look at what happened with Chuck just because he had an interview on TV and said that he thought maybe it was part of a UFO thing. And and look what happened to him. Now, for him, it wasn't a, it's so bad of a deal. But people's lives have been altered right. by this discrimination right. because of their refusal to look at this. And this takes us right back to, obviously, Area 51 right. in the 40s when that, you know, there was more than one crash there. Right. But well, I mean, they only talk about the one. Go yeah. Ahead. Um, well, so the Roswell story is a, is a spectacular story to me. Um, you know, there's the Roswell of today, which is kind of the kitschy, go dress up as a UF, an alien and go have a burger in a flying saucer restaurant. Right. And stuff like that. But the actual story of Roswell is one of the greatest sort of um, uh, uh, cover-ups in, in the Air Force's history. It's 1947. It's a, it's a stormy night. Uh, Walker Air Force Base, which was our first real nuclear base, um, where the planes that bombed Japan were housed, um, they tracked something coming through the sky in, in the middle of a lightning storm. Whatever that thing was, crashed. Um, it hopped, so there were three different crash sites, essentially. But it left 300 yards of debris over a rancher's ranch. The rancher found all this weird metallic debris covered in hieroglyphics, he um, called the local sheriff who called the Air Force Base. The Air Force sent a bunch of people out there. They scooped up the debris. They put out a press release saying, we now have in our possession a flying saucer. Um, they then rescinded their own press release, said it was a weather balloon. 
They made a photo with a radar operator in the debris of a weather balloon. Everyone involved in that photo has since come forward and said that it was a faked photo. Um, the guy in it, the photographer, everyone involved said it was fake. They then took that debris and moved it to Area 51, where it is sitting to this day. Um, that's an amazing story. You know, it, it, it has so many levels to it. it there was an obvious cover-up for whatever reason. Um, and the Air Force still, to this day, won't tell you what they really found there. Um, it obviously was not a weather balloon. Um, what it was, we really don't know. And that's something that, you know, until whoever is controlling those files decides to make them public goes that route, um, it will always be a mystery. And it's, a, it's really a shame. It's because uh, I interviewed the, the grandson of that pilot that... Um, the, Marcel. the picture, the, yeah, Marcel, yeah, yeah um, that picture it was taken of him, and he he was a kid, or mm -hmm. the, I guess he was the child, maybe the he child, the, yeah, he was a child, he was the child, because right. he was an elderly man even then when I spoke with him, um, he talked about what happened that night when his when his dad came home, and what he had, and and you know all of that stuff, and then then he said the next day this is what happened, um, he talked about you know the the people coming in and telling him that he couldn't talk. And uh, he, he even talked about how he felt. You know, as a kid, he would think he was like 8 or 10 years old. Uh, he was talking about how he felt about it, and he was just so um, stressed over the whole thing because of the weirdness of everybody's behavior and yeah. what, what transpired during that photo op and that he was supposed to say that, you know, he was mistaken, that this is what they found and blah, 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 blah. And yeah. it, but his dad had already spoken to him and said that he, I guess his dad had already figured out that it probably wasn't going to stay, the story wasn't going to stay, because he kind of warned him before it happened. So somebody warned him, uh, Mr. Marcel, that this was going to happen, that, you know, the, the government was going to come in and they were going to make him do a different story on it. And he gave some information to the young boy. Of course, he wasn't old enough to think about documenting it or writing it down that it would make some kind of history someday. You know, it was just another day in the life of a child, right? You know? So right. it is a fascinating story. And, of course, to this day, they they, they don't even say that Area 51 exists. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you know, we're it's, supposed to Area 51? Yeah, question mark, right? Right. right. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, that's a fasc it is a fascinating story. And that, I've always thought what a disservice. And I think that's where, that's where began the real, real cover-up of this whole UFO phenomenon. Um, you know, when you stop and think about the cattle mutilations alone and, you know, how some of them are dropped from the sky and et cetera and so forth and how that happened and the weird markings and, and the fact there was no blood and all of those strange things. Um, either somebody's got some really great technology and, you know, somebody's just, you know, doing that for whatever reason. I can't imagine. I can't I mean, even imagine there being any kind of a viable reason that I anybody mean, You know, the, the theories involve like uh, testing some sort of a bioagent um, testing the animals for, um, you know, the bovine blood and organs can be, are very similar to human in some ways. So maybe it's a way of, of looking um, without abducting people, you know, is one theory. Um, and then there's theories involving, you know, a cult, um, that there's some massive cult that's doing it. Um, the FBI, one of their theories was that it was a big biker gang. Uh, <laughs> How done this over 70 years, it seems unlikely. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's different theories about what it could be. Um, I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. So here's here's a question. Um, what is some of the things that he's still doing? Is, I, I heard you say that he was still investigating cattle mutilations. Yeah. Well, what else has he what else has he been up to since that time? Well, you know, Chuck has delved wholeheartedly into this, you know, documenting the 37th parallel going from site to site, uh, talking to as many people as he can. If someone sees something, you know, and he tries to get there first, um, he's got a lot of great equipment now he's put together. Um, so, I mean, in terms of this world, this is what he does. You know, he doesn't make any money at it uh, yet. Um, he's really just trying to really get the truth out there, looking for a smoking gun, uh, essentially, looking for real proof. Um, uh, but that's what he does, you know. He's out there in the, in the field, essentially. I'm trying to get as much information as he can. Well, you know, as I'm looking at this story, and, and based on what some of the other stories that you've done, how did your publisher feel about you doing this, a story like this? Sure. You know, this was an interesting situation. So I sold the movie um, before I sold the book. 
Uh, it's uh, it's going to be a movie with New Line Pictures um, and the guy, Bo Flynn, who produced uh, San Andreas and um, a lot of other movies, um, is producing it. And uh, so after I'd met Chuck, you know, I, I, I thought it was fascinating. I wrote up a, a proposal and I sold the movie with the proposal and then, you know, sold the book off of it. My, my publishers know me. You know, I've worked with the same publisher for a couple books now. And I do these, you know, big true stories that often have a movie attached or a movie developed from. Um, so, you know, I, I think the UFO thing was intriguing to me. I, I've discovered as this book has come out, it's it's uh, it's very um, uh, a lot of people love this topic. So even though it's kind of mocked and ridiculed from a scientific or a mainstream point of view, people really gravitate towards it. Almost everyone either has an experience or knows someone who had an experience. At this point, polls show that half the country believes in UFOs that we've been visited. Um, so there is a big audience for this sort of thing. It just hasn't ever been covered, you know, I think, in such a mainstream way. So it will be intriguing to see the response as time goes by and as the book continues to go. Um, but the publisher was all in. They were very excited about it. Um, and uh, it was just a matter of keeping it as real as possible, as, as documenting Chuck's life getting into the Bigelow thing as much as I could, um, going into this world as a layman, as someone who isn't spending my life. I don't know that much about it initially. And, uh, and uh, it all kind of worked out. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, talk a, let's talk a little bit more then about some of the more specific events that took place in Chuck's life. Um, by the way, uh, when do you think the movie will be out? Well, I mean, we'll make it, you know, we were in the process of attaching a screenwriter right now. So someone ah. has to write screenplay and then we will shoot it next year and then uh, it would come out in 2018 that's the goal well you'll definitely have to have somebody get a hold of me on that so i can promote that for you All i'll right. go see it myself yeah it'll be um, cool yeah yeah so you know i talked to you a little bit at, at the beginning of the show about how some of these incidences that chuck had um talked about is things that i had since forgotten i'd learned about read about heard about whatever the case may be researched on my own I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the Manhattan Project because that one is a, that one is a, a big one. Yeah. So one of the things people often say when you say you know there's a cover up, or they say, well, the U.S. government isn't good at things like that. They can't keep secrets. And one of the stories in the book that I get into is the is the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was was, was the largest cover up in the history of the world. Really, um, the the project developed the atomic bomb involved over a hundred thousand people. Um, of which only about 15 knew what they were actually doing. Uh, they built whole towns, whole cities um, that were secret cities um, that you didn't know about, that didn't even exist on any map um, that people would be brought to uh, and their whole families to, um, to work on the atomic bomb. To, and they'd each work on such a little piece of it that they never really could put together exactly what it is they were doing. The secret was kept until the bomb was dropped. Um, and so it was a vast conspiracy, a vast secret. Uh, part of the project was to keep uh, the whole idea of nuclear science secret. There was a department of censorship created that would censor the word atomic or the word nuclear out of newspapers, magazines, even Buck Rogers comic books were censored um, so that the word nuclear did not appear in them. Um, this is staggering. You know, it's a, a cover up of of a massive proportion um, that was done for uh, what was believed to be a good reason. That's the other interesting thing to me, is not all cover-ups or conspiracies are bad. Often these things are actually done for good reasons. Uh, if, for instance, a UFO did land at Roswell, there might be a very good reason to keep it secret. Um, I don't know what that reason is, but the government might have one. In the 60s, they commissioned the Condon Report, which was a a bunch of professors got together to decide, you know, is the UFO phenomenon real? But one of the questions they were asked was, what would happen if tomorrow we announced that a flying saucer had landed? And their conclusion was it would be complete chaos, that society would fall apart, that people would stop going to work, that religions would fail. Um, and this scared people in the Air Force. And I think if there is a cover-up, that's where it all started. Um, so it might be done for a good reason. The the uh, the Manhattan Project was, you know, to win a war and to end uh, World War II. And I think um, this is something that may have a, a reason like that. Interesting. 
Um, that, that's that, that's an interesting. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, and and I have to tell you, I don't necessarily. I understand what you're saying. I mean, people have said this to me. I don't care who I have on my show. I don't necessarily agree that that pulling the wool over people's eyes is necessarily right. a good thing because what happens is is when they find out it's different. Right. Right? Uh, you know, and, and then, then yeah. what do you think is going to happen? It's like it's like learning the tooth fairy isn't real, right? Remember and how that, you felt? True. <laughs> no, it's true. Information kind of wants to be free, and eventually, information gets free. But you know, sometimes there are things that that need to be covered up. I'm not a, a believer that everything needs to come out all the time. I think something like this, though, I think we've developed. You know. I think yeah. uh, society has changed enough since the 50s and 60s that people would not fall apart knowing that life was here. Um, I don't think the idea that someone visited here in the 50s is going to destroy uh, the American economy. Um, now, religions might have to change a little bit. Um, and I think uh, the re religions as a whole have to deal with the alien life thing sooner or later. Because sooner or later, we're going to find proof that somewhere out there there is life and how that affects the big religions of the world um i don't know yet i think they're going to have to come to grips with it i think they can adapt religions always seem to adapt um the story always seems to change um as we find new things right so uh so you know listen uh, australia didn't exist in the bible <laughs> it exists now um things like that happen um so uh so you know religions will have to get used to it i think and, and I have to agree. I, there's some things I'm sure that I really wouldn't want to know. Somebody was talking right. about Area 51 today and about, uh, you know, do we really, would you really want to know everything that they have down there? And I'm not sure that, you know, even for the most open minded person, uh, right. if, if they could really handle exactly what they saw or knew about uh, to that extent, you know, where you would know all of that. And I think right. it could be a little bit mind blowing, but. Um, I can tell you, I feel like that there's a change coming with all of that. I mean, mm -hmm. we we had the the Pope. I think it was the Pope, wasn't it? Or the, uh, the Vatican came out and said we have to embrace our star brothers and sisters. I mean, and that they, was they, a they, comment, you know, and it, it makes you think. Well, what do they know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. It's got to be a lot going on. Well, right. let's talk a little bit more about what were some of the more specific sites that Chuck investigated as you were. You know, putting together his story that you found interesting. I mean, I know we talked about the the one branch, and then we also talked about Area Fifty One. Right. Um, what was some of the other ones that you might have really? Right. Well, I got a little bit into Dulce Dulce Mountain, which is a uh, um, there's an underground base there. Um, it's something that Bigelow's people looked into. They sent scientists to Dulce to try and find this underground base. Um, there are people who believe it's a, an alien base. There are other people who believe it's a American military base. There's other people who believe it's a joint American military alien base. Um, there's no question about whether or not there's a base, though. Right. Um, and uh, and Chuck goes there uh, looking for something. He had had a sighting there himself um, when he was researching something. Um, so that is definitely one of the places that's in the story. Um, I get into the the hum in Taos. Uh, I think that that is an intriguing story about this whole town that hums. Uh, a percentage of people there can hear this persistent, uh, annoying, um, humming noise. It, it's investigated numerous times in history. Um, there are certain theories about it. It involves some sort of underground drilling or some sort of uh, alien phenomenon. We go to Sedona in the story where there are the vortexes, which is kind of a Native American thing, but there are these vortexes that kind of open up and you'll be driving in the middle of the night and, and something will, will, some sort of energy field occurs there and, and Chuck goes to look at that. Um, yeah, a lot of cattle mutilations, a lot of the, the history of cattle mutilations, going back to the original cattle mutilation, um, the this, this snippy the horse story, which we get into in the story. Um, yeah, and, uh, and, and, and numerous other ones, but those are kind of the big ones. The Foo Fighter phenomenon, I think, is a really intriguing phenomenon that, again, everyone knows the name Foo Fighter from the band, but the original term comes from a phenomenon in the 40s, during World War II, American pilots and British pilots flying over the Rhine uh, kept seeing these fireballs. Uh, these formations of fireballs would fly right alongside their airplanes. 
And it got to a point where the New York Times ran a cover story. What are these Foo Fighters? Um, are they some weird German weapon? Uh, after the war, when we captured the German scientists, we, we interrogated them and asked them what these fireballs were, and they had no idea. Um, so it, it's something weird happened. Uh, Roswell happened shortly after that. Um, so the first flying saucer that Kenneth Arnold saw was a year after the Foo Fighter phenomenon ended. And then shortly after that, within weeks, you have Roswell. Um, so, you know, that to me is, a, is a, a flag that if something was going on in that time period, those three things are probably related. Um, but, um, but that's a phenomenon that, you know, to this day, the fireball type of UFO is still something that's seen um, here and there. And, and what it is, you know, we don't know. Yeah, um, I interviewed uh, Dr. Lynn Kitai, um, and she wrote the book on the Phoenix Lights and how mm -hmm. many people uh, had actually witnessed that and how she witnessed it. Um, and she come under a, a lot of scrutiny over that over that book. I mean, I, I think she was, uh, I can't remember what kind of a medical doctor she was now. It's been many years ago since she wrote that book. Uh, but it was a fascinating read in as much as watching what happened to her town and all the people around it. But that's still another one that's, you know, on the books is the, is the Phoenix right. Lights uh, because so many people witnessed it. Right. Um, and I, there again, that incident over there in California, I don't know if Chuck talks about it in his book, I can't remember, where there was all that open fire into the sky for I don't know how many hours uh, our military went out and was just blowing up the sky um, and I can't remember what their cover story was now, but people think that they were firing upon a UFO. Right, um, the missile of some sort that went on the wrong direction or something like that um, was the idea. But yeah, yeah, I mean, these, these things happen again and again and again where you have sort of, a, you know, some sort of event or some sort of, a, you know, um, sighting. And if it were anything other than UFOs, all of these witness accounts would lead to some sort of investigation. But in the world of UFOs, witness accounts don't mean anything. <laughs> um, so it's uh, it's intriguing, you know. It, it would be enough to convict someone of a crime. You have a hundred witnesses to something, but it wouldn't be enough to to have you look at whether or not there was a UFO. Interesting correlation there. I like that, Ben. Right. <laughs> I didn't I didn't think about it that way, but that's very interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So again, we're going to bring it back to the 37th parallel. All of these events, most of these events that have been documented, um, again, and we were talking about the Dulce bases, the underground bases. We're talking about the military underground bases. We're talking about cattle mutilations. And then this 37th parallel, isn't that event that I was talking about over there in uh, California along that same line as well. I believe so. We, Area 51 is, you know, the Taos Hum is, um, uh, all of these things occur. Dulce is, they're all on the 37th. You know, and, it, and it's, it's an interesting way to look at it. You know, it's a way to sort of correlate it all if you want, and that's essentially what Chuck does, yeah. Well, and I, I really enjoyed the story on how he actually put that all together to begin with, where he was, you know, in his office and he put that map up and Right. This was, he was just actually just kind of making a map for himself of where he's been. Right. I you mean, know, he, he, was, he was working on a map of, of his own investigations. And then there was an earthquake um, in Colorado um, near him on the 37th parallel. Uh, a second earthquake uh, in Virginia, in Washington, uh, near Washington, D.C., on the same 37th parallel. That got him intrigued by the idea that, that these two things you know, whether they're related or not, the fact is they were in the same sort of geographic line, and that's when it sort of clicked to him that all these things he was looking at were along the 37th. Um, and so it was an interesting sort of moment in his life. And that's not to take away from all the other incidences that are reported that are not on the 37th parallel, but it does seem like the majority of events, significant events, are going along this line that goes all the way across the United States. It actually, doesn't it go all the way around the globe as well? It does. It does. And uh, Chuck himself hasn't really gone around the world looking into it, um, but I'm, I'm betting you will find uh, a lot more if you were to continue with that line around. Um, but, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a latitude going across the world, yeah. You know, that'd be interesting to see if that would correlate at all with the crop circles and stuff that are, that, you know, that they're always finding over there as well. I mean, I think that would just be... An interesting phenomenon. 
You've got yeah. me. You've got me. I'm sure some of the audience out there is probably already starting their research now, even as we speak. I can tell you that. <laughs> It'll be the sequel. The sequel to the book is going to oh, be. Oh, yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> right. Well, and that's exciting, though, to, to see that, that there's a, a book coming or a movie coming out about this book um, because it's all documented cases. This is not just, you know, some embellishment by Hollywood that this is right. actual you know, actual investigations and research and et cetera and so forth. Now we've we have a lot of shows where I think we're 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 getting better with some of the shows that are being produced, like the Ancient Aliens. They right. do a lot of research on their things and bringing out uh, some of their other other investigations as well as far as what they call the ancient astronauts, right? Uh, UFOs, whatever. Uh, I I'm hoping real soon, Ben, that we can actually come across some 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 pieces that will be presented that will be mainstream and get off this whole thing of, you know, if you have a hundred people that witness something, like you said, the UFO sighting that they're all mass hallucinating. But if you have a hundred people that, you know, witness a, a car accident or a crime, it's, it's all oh good. You know, it's like, well, right. it's a little upside down in this. <laughs> yes. It's <laughs> interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's people are a blank, blank spot to this. They can't, they can't see um, this being something real. And, you know, once you refuse to believe it's real, it doesn't matter what you're shown or what you're told, you're just not going to believe it. That's true. It's true. People get pretty stubborn in that. And, right. uh, you know, and to be fair, you know, the reverse is true too. Some people believe too much. Um, yeah. Sometimes, you know, you, you interview someone and, and they're believing every single thing, and then it becomes harder, sort of, to to take them legitimately too. It, it, there's got to be sort of a middle ground. Um, you, yeah. Agreed. You have to be willing to look at both sides or the many sides, and then draw your own conclusions. But I've come to the point in my life where I look at things, and what I know today doesn't mean that tomorrow I won't change my mind because I may find some new information that that makes what I thought was true or valid. Right. invalidate it so you know it's not that you lied the day before it's just that you have new information and you're drawing a different conclusion based on the new information so yeah. I like to share that with people so that they themselves you know understand that about whatever's going on in their life as well so we we talked a lot you you had he had a lot of incidences in Colorado uh, Colorado seems to be kind of a, a big place for him do you have any other stories that you could share with us before we you know, we go any further in this today. Um, you know, in terms of 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 of, uh, of what <laughs> of other of other places or yeah, other places in Colorado where he was able to uh, investigate, where he found some of those things that were more were it, yeah. that made it into this book. I'm sure there yeah, was a lot I mean, that didn't make it in Colorado. It's 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 you know the majority of things he's looking into the cattle mutilations because they're. There's a, there's a lot going on on the ranches around there. So he, he does see uh, a numerous cattle ranches. He started bringing the carcasses to veterinary um, specialists at the University of Colorado um, to be analyzed. Um, but, you know, it's his home base, but he would drive anywhere, sort of, you know, he got a report that something was happening. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's all over that area. So his big thing really is in the cattle mutilations. I mean, not, not that he doesn't investigate the UFO thing, but the cattle mutilations, and they seem to be uh, synonymous almost with each other, I guess is yeah, a good way I mean, of saying that. It's his focus. It's his area of expertise. It's the thing that he's, you know, best at, but he's certainly, um, you know, intrigued by the UFO phenomenon as well. So he's, he's, he's investigating both those things. Absolutely. Yeah. That's fantastic. And I think that we've... And I remember the first time I started reading and hearing about him. I just it was just it was just an awful thought to think about what could have happened to these beautiful creatures. You know what what could have happened to them, right. um, and, and you know we don't even know what happens. To, you know what happens to some of the people that they find. I wonder. That's the other thing that kind of gets to me. Is there part of an untold story here? people that's gone missing, did, did they experience something like this, you know, where they've never found them? I mean, you know, I mean, it, it can happen. I'm not saying it does. I'm just saying it could happen. And I just think about all these things and I think, wow, this is something that needs, really needs to be investigated. It needs 
something, and I don't know what could be done. I mean, other than just putting cameras everywhere on your ranch property to figure out what you know what happens when your cattle are out or what have you. I don't know. I don't know how you could capture something like this unless you just happen to time it just right and actually see the event taking place. Mm-hmm. But that being said, it's the after effects. You know, these the EMF readings, the, the the surgical precisions. Somebody knows something, and even if it's even if it's just a supposition, they still know right. something. Right. The evidence is there somewhere. I mean, it's just people aren't really looking at it. Um, in the right way. The police who show up on the scene have no idea what they're looking at. Um, they write it off pretty quickly, you know, and, and, and they, they don't have an answer. No one's ever been arrested. 10,000 cases and not a single person has ever been arrested. And, you know, I think that's absolutely fascinating, too, that uh, out of all of these cases that, that nothing has ever come of any of it. I mean, we don't hear any follow-up on anything like that. I mean, we've heard about the stories, right? Right. But you never hear the follow-up, ever. As right. a story, a little blurb in the newspaper or whatever, uh, if you're an Internet reader, it's a little blurb here, but we never hear the back end of it. What happened afterwards? What did they find? What was the findings? But we don't ever get that research. We don't get that information. And I think that's also a big disservice to, especially yeah. to the people that this happened to, their, their, their cattle, their you know, precious animals like the horses and things. Right. It's wild. Um, it's wild. And, you know, if you think that it's copycats or college kids or whatever, you would think someone would mess up and, and leave evidence. <laughs> you would think somewhere someone would would have gotten caught. Um, the fact that no one's ever been caught makes you wonder. Yeah, yeah that goes beyond usually the, the human aspect of it, if you ask right. me. I mean, we, we're, we're, if we're doing something that many times, you know we're going to have a ba- off day, right? <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. Yeah. We're going to mess up somewhere. Yeah. And so uh, Brian is asking me something about a whistleblowers. So no whistleblowers have come forward then on this topic for you other than... You know, in, in terms of my, me, no. I mean, I, the book just came out. I do get a lot of emails, but, um, you know, who knows what's real and what's not. When the FBI did their investigation, a prisoner did come forward claiming he was part of this vast biker gang. That's where they got this biker gang theory. Um, And he gave them all this detail about how the bikers would uh, use cardboard uh, to keep them from putting footprints down, that they would raise these cows on these, 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 these pulley systems, that they would suck the blood out using syringe. It was just so far fetched. Um, that the FBI kind of discounted it. Um, so who knows, but this was the one guy who sort of came forward with one possible explanation. But no, no one's ever, you know, come to me and told me what's going on. I mean, I, you know, people do come to me, but I don't think any of it is, is the problem is, is you really have to, you have to really investigate this stuff. It can't just be theories and theories and theories. Um, and that's what nobody's really doing. You know, the, the police aren't doing it. The FBI are no longer doing it. Chuck is doing it. Um, and he's just one guy. With an RV, um, so who knows what he's gonna find? Yeah. Well, my hope is is that um, is that after all of this is said and done, yeah. with this book coming out and everything, that maybe uh, you know maybe there'll be, there'll be some good people that will step forward that you know believe like he does and and have that same same right. conviction and and really the wherewithal just to focus on what this is and to help him with it um right. that would that would be a, a wonderful thing to get some answers and ben please do me a favor honestly if you hear anything um i would just love to hear back from you with an update um on anything if you find some additional information uh, something where people could you know maybe go and investigate themselves if you find anything i would really really love to hear from you about that and i'm sure my sure. Uh, audience would as well i'd be happy to post anything that you would send along the way that'd Thanks. be really great awesomeness so ben as we're kind of wrapping it up where we we have a little bit of time left but uh we can certainly uh wrap this up anytime that you're ready but what i would like to do is have you kind of in a in kind of a nutshell is maybe to share again uh, with people um, the idea behind the 37th parallel, um, just a little short synopsis of the whole book, and then, of course, we need to know uh, where they can purchase this book sure. and how we can find out more information of when your uh, your 
movie will also be released on it. Yeah, okay. So, well, the 37th parallel is the true story of Chuck Zukowski, um, a reserve sheriff's deputy in Colorado who was investigating a cattle mutilation when he was fired from the sheriff's department for mentioning a possible link to UFOs. He became a UFO hunter, um, began uh, investigating both cattle mutilations and UFO sightings, and came to the conclusion that a majority of these things occur along the, the 37th parallel of the United States, which is a geographic line running through the center of the country. Um, and then uh, kind of he goes down that rabbit hole. And uh, it's a wild story. It's going to be a movie eventually. And uh, I, it introduced me to the world of UFOs and to a belief that <laughs> something probably did happen in the 40s. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, it will change the mainstream's mind about the phenomenon as a whole. You can get the book anywhere. You know, it should be in every airport and Barnes and Nobles. And uh, my website is benmesrick.com. I'm on Twitter at Ben Mesrick. I'm on Facebook at Ben Mesrick. So I put up the information about where I'm going to be or what I'm going to be doing. Um, but for the most part, you know, I'm out there doing doing the doing the book tour right now. So uh, I'm I'm, uh, I'm everywhere. <laughs> I don't really know where I am. Um, but- <laughs> Bless your heart. We're yeah, wild riding under your hat. Well, uh, you know, find me on, on the web, just putting my name in, and, and a million things come up. Um, but yeah, Amazon is great too, and your indie bookstore, and wherever you like to buy books. Great. You know what? I have to tell you, I really, really, honestly, I can tell you, I so enjoyed uh, this book. I enjoyed uh, all of the information. I enjoyed the. Uh, the way it was put together because it again as i said before it sparked some you know re- memories for me of oh man i've forgotten about that you know and hey, right and, my, and then now my picture gets bigger and again like i said it really did it kind of it kind of excited me and i'm i hope that people will get this book and it excites them as much as it did me well, um, thank you very much and i hope that people continue to do their research and ben this has really been wonderful I'm assuming that on your on your Facebook page and on your website that you'll let people know where you're going to be in case sure. you come to a town near you or right. near them rather. You'll be visiting their town, I guess, that they right. can come see you and get a book. And uh, I hope so. And I, I wish you great, tremendous success with this book because it, it's it's deserved for sure. Uh, and I, well. and I, I hope Chuck gets gets the recognition in a good way that he deserves as well for his you know, he's been he's a been a steadfast kind of guy. You've got to admit that. Right. So. Well, yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, and uh, thanks for thanks. I'm glad people are watching. So thank you. You're so. welcome, Ben, and thank you, and to everyone out there. Thank you so much for joining us. Until we meet again, where will your life's journey lead you? Many blessings, everyone, and good night.